Good morning and happy Sabbath. It's a great honor and pleasure to be able to share a message with you this morning. But before we go any further, I'd like us to first start off with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the opportunity for allowing us the, the means to gather virtually. Thank you so much for uh, the opportunity you've given me today and the entire church that we may open up your word and learn something new. May your word speak for me and not mine. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. The Chicago Tribune featured a story in July 2002 about um, a true story that happened in the United States. Back in 1958, a baby boy was born into the Lane family. And the father of the Lane family was known to be an eccentric man. And he always wanted his children to have different, unique names. So he thought, why not name my firstborn son Winner? How could the young boy ever fail to succeed with a name like Winner Lane? Several years passed and the Lanes then had another son. And for unknown reasons, they named this boy Loser, Loser Lane. How tragic to doom the young boy's future prospects with a name like Loser Lane. How many counseling sessions would it take to undo that? Of course, all the family's friends thought they knew how the two boys' lives would unfold. One would be the epitome of success and the other always trailing behind. But contrary to all expectations, Loser Lane succeeded. He graduated from college and later became a sergeant and successful detective with the New York Police Department, shield number 2762. No one felt comfortable calling him Loser anymore. They just referred to him as Lou. And what of the other brother, the winner? The most noteworthy achievement of Winner Lane was the sheer of his criminal record. Inmate number 00R28Q7 had nearly three dozen arrests for burglary, domestic violence, trespassing, resisting arrest, and much more. Expectations. They can often be a strong force of good in our lives. We expect excellence of ourselves, parents from their children, schools from students, and so on. But can our expectations take away our ability to see or even become our blind spot? Have you ever walked by someone you thought you knew but in that millisecond, you briefly looked up and you put two and two together and you realized that's the person you were thinking of and you ran after them to say hi. Or you chose not to out of fear that it may not actually be the person you were thinking of. Regardless, you seeing that person from a distance, their physical characteristics reminds you of someone you know without them having spoken a single word. But what if you spent every waking hour with someone for three full years and say they have to leave for a few days, but then they come back. And when you happen to see them again at a distance, but not just see them again, hear their voice too, you don't recognize them. How? Why? Today we'll be opening our Bibles to John chapter 21 the infamous chapter where Jesus asks Peter, do you love me, three times, where he repeats his miracle of the multitudes of fish, 153 to be exact, or where he supplies the breakfast by the sea, but also where seven disciples had failed to recognize Christ himself. In our study this morning, we will focus on how it was possible for the disciples not to recognize Christ. From John chapter 21, verse three, we read, Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. They said to him, we are going with you also. They went out and immediately got into the boat and that night they caught nothing. But when the morning had now come, Jesus stood on the shore Yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. And some versions even say they didn't even recognize him. How could they have not known? In verse 14, we find an even more puzzling fact. 
This is now the third time Jesus showed himself to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. We see Jesus's first post-resurrection appearance in John chapter 20, verse 19, when Jesus encounters the apostles in the upper room for the first time. The second time was when Thomas comes in verse 26, who missed the first reunion. And the third is here in John 21 at the Sea of Galilee, otherwise referred to as the Sea of Tiberias. So the disciples, after seeing Christ twice before, here, they are unable to discern who he is. If anyone was close to Christ in human history, it was the disciples. Every waking hour for three full years, roughly 1,095 days, 26,280 hours, but yet they did not know who he was. If it was so easy for them to lose sight of who Christ was, how much more in danger are we? What manifested the strange behavior? Can we fall in the same trap? Can we prevent it? To first understand the disciples' strange behavior, we need to gain a better understanding of what were they dealing with? What was on their minds? Were they preoccupied by something? Some could say that the disciples' lack of recognition of Christ could be because of grief. They had just witnessed their beloved teacher crucified and publicly shamed in such a brutal manner. And we do see grief having an immense impact on the disciples within the Gospels. If we turn to John chapter 20, verse 15, we find the account of the lone Mary Magdalene weeping in front of the empty tomb. But then Jesus approaches her. We read, he asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him and I will get him. Note that of all things, Mary took Jesus himself to be a gardener. How odd. Biblical commentators are in wide agreement that it was Mary's grief that prevented her from recognizing Christ right after his resurrection. One author writes, Mary's vision could have been blurred by her tears and sorrow. Ellen White in Acts of the Apostles confirms the deep anguish the disciples were feeling right after Christ's crucifixion. She writes, crushed by despondency, grief, and despair, the disciples met together in the upper chamber. But let me ask you a question. Can grief or sorrow have such a blinding effect? At the University of Maryland School of Medicine, there was a power couple, doctors William Weiner and Lisa Shulman, both of whom were neurologists. They researched together, made groundbreaking discoveries, and most of all, they made a lasting impact on the wider medical profession. However, it all came to an abrupt end when Dr. William Weiner passed away at the age of 67 following a grueling battle with cancer. His wife and partner in life, Dr. Lisa Shulman, had lost her closest friend, colleague, partner in life and love of her life. She described the grief as disorienting. She was incapable of doing the most basic tasks. It became a mystery that she referred to as a state of fog. But then she had a realization. As a practicing neurologist, I thought I was prepared, but instead I struggled. It took many months until I had a flash of insight. For the first time, I saw my experience through the eyes of a neurologist. She then sought to understand why and how does grief have such a strong physical impact. The result of her research was an entire book but one of her major findings was that after a person had experienced the loss of a loved one, their brain would behave in the same way as someone who had succumbed to physical brain injury, leading to the term emotional brain trauma. 
In addition, she noticed that the fear center of the brain, otherwise known as the amygdala, began to overpower even the logical coherent functions of the mind. But would the impact be as far reaching as facial recognition? Was grief the reason why Mary couldn't recognize Jesus right after his resurrection? It's been discovered that there is a particular region in the brain responsible for facial recognition alone. And it is located at the bottom surface of the temporal lobe. The temporal lobe, however, also plays an active role in the logical coherent functions of our mind. And the amygdala, the fear center of the brain, is in the frontal portion of the very same temporal lobe. Therefore, researchers believe that it's highly likely for the effects of grief to severely impact our ability to even recognize faces, describing the phenomenon as a fog of confusion, where basic functions become so overbearing and complex. But what's interesting is how Jesus responds to Mary. With one word, he says, Mary. It's as if he's saying, hello, it's me. And in that instant, the fog clears and Mary knows before whom she stands. But the disciples' reaction could probably be explained by grief when they see Jesus alive the first time after his death, but most certainly not the third time. They know he's alive. Well, maybe Jesus' actual appearance had changed. Many scholars have sought to understand if this could have been a possibility, a post-resurrection transfiguration of sorts. It's important to note, though, that whenever this happened, we see it recorded in scripture. For example, in Mark 9, verses 2 to 3, where the disciples witness Jesus' transfiguration when he meets with Moses and Elijah. Mark describes that his clothes became white. And Luke describes the same instance in chapter 9, verse 29, even saying that his face was altered. It is clear then that a change would have been noticeable to the disciples. It will be distinguishable and important enough to have been included in the gospel records. However, scripture mentions no change in appearance upon Christ's resurrection aside from his wounds. Likewise, the spirit of prophecy makes no mention of this either. But the disciples already met Jesus twice after his resurrection and before John 21, meaning they would know what he looked like. So this is pointing us to the possibility that instead it was the inability of the disciples to discern who Jesus was or him intentionally not allowing for his recognition. Scripture's record on the two disciples walk to a mouse can give us further direction. In Luke chapter 24, verses 15 to 16, we read, as they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. And in verse 31, it concludes, then their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he disappeared from their sight. In one of Ellen White's sermons on the road to Emmaus, she cites William Hanna's book, The Life of Christ, written in 1863, where he speaks of the disciples' lack of recognition of Christ on their walk to Emmaus. He writes, our Lord purposely concealed himself till his work of instruction was completed and drew a veil of some kind over their eyes, which hindered their discovery of him. In Signs of the Times, Ellen White reiterates the same point by saying, their eyes had been clouded so that they had not before discerned him. But going back to John 21, this doesn't seem to be the case that Jesus intentionally hid himself. Wouldn't it be mentioned in the gospels just as it was on the walk to a mouse? Well, what about the element of surprise? Maybe the disciples weren't expecting Jesus at the Sea of Galilee while they were out fishing. If we look back to Matthew's account of the first post-resurrection reunion of the apostles with Jesus, in Matthew chapter 28, verse 10, we read, Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. 
go and tell my brethren to go to Galilee and there they will see me. That was the reason why the disciples were in Galilee in John 21 in the first place. They knew who they were waiting for. So there was no way it could have been an element of surprise of that magnitude. Then what else could it be? Distance, could it be distance? Maybe the disciples were way deep into the sea to be able to even know who was on shore. First of all, if distance was the issue, they wouldn't be able to clearly hear Jesus's command when he says, throw your net. As well, they were able to see and make out some kind of stranger. To answer our doubts even further, in John chapter 21, verse eight, we find a gem. It reads, the other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from shore, about a hundred yards. So it's clear, they were not too far from shore, but how far out can the human eye see? According to a recent study, it was concluded that on average, the human eye can see around 4.8 kilometers away or three miles well beyond 100 yards, which is approximately 91 meters, well below 4.8 kilometers. As I was reflecting on this, I was reminded of a very vivid memory from when I was seven years old. Something had happened to me at, at school and I became soaking wet, so I needed a new change of clothes, shoes, socks, everything. I remember it was just after 10.30 a.m., so right after snack time, so I, I had a whole day of school in front of me. I couldn't just pack my backpack and go home. But my school was in the same neighborhood as our house. And in fact, there were many windows in my school that faced the road that led into my very street. I remember being brought to the school office while they made some calls. I didn't know who they were calling. So I sat on the office bench and I waited. But then I saw through the window facing the road that led into my street, this gold bike coming closer and closer from the far distance. And I thought, that looks exactly like our bike. Then I started thinking, my dad's not home, so he has the car, and we only had one car, but my mom is. And so maybe in order for her to get to me as fast as she possibly could, she must have taken our bike to come to my rescue. And in that instant I knew, without even clearly seeing who it was, that it was my mom coming with a fresh change of clothes. Therefore, even distance doesn't sound quite convincing as an explanation for why the disciples hadn't recognized someone with whom they were so close and even expecting. If it wasn't grief, and it most likely wasn't a physical change or Jesus hiding himself either, nor the element of surprise or distance. What prevented the disciples from recognizing Christ the third time? In John chapter 21, verse five, we see the words by which Christ addresses his disciples. In the New King James Version, it reads, children, have you any food? And most versions alternate between the use of children, young men, or even friends. But why such a difference in terms used? John would regularly use terms that would be understood in Roman Greco societies, but maybe less so by us today. The original word used for children in this text is paidia. It appears in scripture twice, but this is the only time it appears in the entire gospel records, meaning Christ himself hadn't used it before. So even his choice of words wouldn't have given the disciples a hint of who was speaking. Yet the importance of its use must not be overlooked. The term paidia doesn't just mean child, but rather a young child under training it has the same stem as words such as paideia, which refer to the rearing or education of someone who would be a member of the polis or Greek government. Another common relative of paideia is paidagogos, 
which we might be more familiar with. It refers to guardian, teacher, or supervisor, the root for the word pedagogue. Meaning Jesus isn't referring to his disciples as just children, but as men who are as young children in need of training or education. Further, it's interesting that John uses this very same word, paidia, only once more, and it appears in 1 John chapter 2, verses 12 to 14. Within the passage, we see that children appears twice, but the word that John uses for children in verse 12 is different than the one he uses in verse 14. In verse 12, he writes, technia. Technia refers to biological children, either literally or figuratively. And for example, many biblical commentaries point to the use of the word technia when Matthew uses it in chapter two, when Rachel is weeping for her children. Children is written as technia. However, in 1 John chapter two, verse 14, we see paidia for the second and final time in scripture. Paidia would not be used to represent one's own child. Instead, we must understand why does John shift in his use of terms from verse 12 to 14? Why does he use paidia? Here he uses paidia in order to define three groups of Christians. The newly converted, those who are still under instruction, or immature Christians. So by Jesus calling out the disciples as paidia, is he maybe pointing to the disciples' necessity to grow in faith? But how could they be young in faith? Shouldn't they be the young men 1 John chapter 2 refers to with a vigor and belief unparalleled to none? Well, to try and comprehend this, we have to go back a bit. What on earth are the disciples doing fishing in the first place? I, I always breeze past that detail, but we have to hold on a minute. In John chapter 21, verse three, we read, Peter says, I am going fishing. Shouldn't they be rejoicing, telling everyone the Messiah is risen? They had just witnessed a resurrection. Or maybe he's speaking of a brief fishing trip. Well, the, in the original, the word used for going is hupago. We see this word used by Christ on two occasions. The first is in Matthew chapter 26, verse 24, when he's alluding to his crucifixion and death at the Last Supper, where he says, the son of man will go just as it is written about him. The second instance, we see John himself use Hupago in chapter six, verse 67, when some of Jesus' followers decide to depart from Jesus because they had difficulty accepting his teachings. And when they leave, Jesus turns to his 12 disciples and he asks, you do not want to leave too, do you? In essence, throughout scripture and even Greek literature, Hupago doesn't just refer to I'm going and I'll come back in a jiffy. No, but rather it refers to final departure, either of someone who ceases to be someone's companion or a departure from life itself. Therefore, Peter isn't saying, I'm just going fishing for recreation, but I bid you farewell and I retire to my fishing. But the shock doesn't cease here. No, what do the other six apostles say? We are going with you also. They join him in his hupago. They too leave everything behind. To understand this desperate action, we must recall the verse when Jesus invites his disciples to meet him at Galilee. How many does he call? He extends an invitation to all of his disciples. But how many do we see listed in John chapter 21? Just seven. Well, what happened to the others? But worst of all, even as they're awaiting Christ himself, they give up. For us today, the resurrection is a celebration, the greatest day in the universe, the victory over sin, 
But yet it seems the disciples aren't too convinced. If we go one chapter back in John chapter 20, verse nine, we see a little clue as to what was this burden that was weighing down the disciples after Christ's crucifixion. We read, for as yet they did not know the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. So wait, the disciples did not know that Jesus was going to rise again on the third day? Not only did they not know, they did not believe. In Desire of Ages chapter 82, we read, the day that was a day of rejoicing to all heaven was to the disciples a day of uncertainty, confusion, and perplexity. The news of Christ's resurrection was so different from what they had anticipated that they could not believe it. They scarcely knew what the resurrection from the dead could mean. They were unable to take in the great subject. But did Jesus not foretell his death and resurrection to them before? In scripture, we see that he doesn't speak of his death and resurrection once or twice, but three times directly to the disciples. For example, in Luke chapter 18, verses 31 to 33, we read, Jesus took the 12 aside and told them, we are going up to Jerusalem and everything that is written by the prophets about the son of man will be fulfilled. He will be delivered over to the Gentiles. They will mock him, insult him and spit on him. They will flog him and kill him. On the third day, he will rise again. He lays out everything word for word. But worst of all, we read in verse 34, the disciples did not understand any of this. Its meaning was hidden from them and they did not know what he was talking about. In fact, this presents a gross irony. He made his resurrection known so clearly throughout his ministry that even the Pharisees not just understood his resurrection, but anticipated it. In Matthew chapter 26, verse 62 to 64, we read, the next day, the one after preparation day, the chief priests and the Pharisees went to Pilate. Sir, they said, we remember that while he was still alive, that deceiver said, after three days, I will rise again. So give the order for the tomb to be made secure until the third day. The Pharisees believed in Jesus' resurrection, but his own disciples didn't. The disciples did not know, not because they didn't hear it. They chose not to hear it. It was completely contrary to their expectations. Further, in the desire of ages, we find that the teachings of the Sadducees on the impossibility of a resurrection had a greater influence on the disciples than Christ's own words. It says they had heard so much of the doctrines and the so-called scientific theories of the Sadducees that the impression made on their minds in regard to the resurrection was vague. So what were they expecting? They were clearly anticipating something entirely different. On the walk to Emmaus, this is revealed very succinctly by the two disciples. In Luke chapter 24, verse 21, they say, but we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. They had their agenda for Jesus's ministry. In Acts chapter one, verse six, we see this repeated again when we read the account just before Jesus's ascension. It says, then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? This was such a strong anticipation that even after Christ's resurrection, the disciples were still expecting a kingdom on earth, freedom from Roman oppression. The scholar N.T. Wright describes the shattered expectations regarding the Jewish Messiah King. He says, it is unlikely that the followers of a crucified would-be Messiah would regard such a person as the true Messiah. 
Jesus did not rebuild the temple. He had not only not defeated the Romans, he had died at their hands in the manner of failed revolutionary leaders. So even when Jesus appears to the disciples the first time and the second, the, their desires and hopes are shattered. Those that Christ had poured into, depended on to continue his work, are totally lost and discouraged. Their expectations of Jesus placed him in their blind spot. It is in this state of mind that the disciples intend to hupago, retire for good to their old ways and never return. In the desire of ages, it describes what was going through their minds as they fished that night in John 21. Through the weary hours, they talked of their absent Lord and recalled the wonderful events they had witnessed in his ministry beside the sea. They questioned as to their own future and grew sad at the prospect before them. In other words, after they had even seen Jesus, they were shook to their very core. It is in this crisis that Jesus encounters his disciples on the shore and says, Paidia, or in our language, Dechitze. He acknowledges their need for further guidance and understanding. However, let's contrast this mysterious behavior of the disciples with probably the first instance in scripture where Jesus says, I am the Messiah. To whom does he say it to? If we turn to John chapter 14, verses 19 and then 25 to 30, we read of the Samaritan woman by the well. From verse 19, it says, Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Then in verse 25, the woman said, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I the one speaking to you, I am he. Just then his disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with a woman. But no one asked, what do you want? Or why are you talking with her? Then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? For this Samaritan woman, in an instant, something clicks. She gets it. She even forgets her water. But in that moment, nothing else matters. She, a Samaritan, who had definitely much less, less knowledge of the scripture than the disciples, recognized Jesus just by a short conversation. Well, what worked for her that was seemingly impeding the apostles in John 21? First, the Samaritans had a different expectation of who the Messiah would be. They based their entire definition of Christ upon Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 18, as they only accepted the first five books of our Bible today. And the verse reads, I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brethren and will put my words in his mouth and he shall speak to them all that I command him. The expectation wasn't a military victor or a political leader, but as the woman says, one that would explain all things. So when Jesus clarifies her confusion on the right place or form of worship, that verse rings in her mind. And that is why she is able to say, I see that you are a prophet, but she does not yet see the Messiah. So what brought her to the final realization? It's not that she didn't have expectations of her own. In verses 10 to 11, it says, then Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living, wa living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? She's basically telling him, you don't even have a bucket with which to draw water. <laughs> 
So clearly she too doesn't fully grasp the words of Christ. But the difference is she is humble. She sets herself aside and she earnestly seeks the truth. We are all aware of the infamous animosity between the ancient Jews and the Samaritans. But for Jesus, as a man, to not just approach her, but to speak to her, should have caused her to run for the hills. But no, what does she do? She engages with him in conversation. She listens, she asks. She is not afraid to acknowledge her lack of understanding, which didn't withdraw her from Christ or lead her to make her own conclusions, but she drew closer to him. Even when Jesus speaks out loud her failings, she is not defensive, but yet she is open to listen and hear. The disciples in this particular regard had their own idea of who the Messiah should be and were not prepared to be told otherwise. Human interpretation and hope built on our own expectations and not genuine facts are ideas that put a veil over our eyes and render us unable to even recognize God himself. Instead of following Jesus's plan for them, the disciples set an agenda for him and expected him to fulfill their expectations. They had a relationship with an imaginary Messiah versus the Lamb of God that all of scripture pointed to. They had no relationship with the risen savior. They were back to square one, but it is in their hupago, their confusion, their state of fog, that Jesus comes to them. He addresses his paidia, dechitze. He seeks to remind them once again of that first love, the first miracle of the multitudes of fish, the memories of their ministry with him, which could physically be seen all around at the Sea of Galilee. And Ellen White describes in the, in the Desire of Ages, they found themselves surrounded by reminders of Jesus and his mighty works. On this sea, when their hearts were filled with terror and the fierce storm was hurrying them to destruction, Jesus had walked upon the billows to their rescue. Here, the tempest had been hushed by his word. Within sight was the beach where above 10,000 persons had been fed from a few small loaves and fishes. As the disciples looked upon the scene, their minds were full of the words and deeds of their risen savior. Jesus sought a renewed relationship with his disciples. It is only once the disciples are reminded of that first love, the first miracle after the multitudes of fish appears once again, does John say, it is the Lord. It's not enough to have an unparalleled knowledge of Christ. If we don't set our expectations aside and agendas aside and earnestly seek a relationship with him and give God the room to set out his expectations for our lives, we will not recognize him. But Jesus doesn't just call us, he feeds us. He invites failure to dine with him. He seeks this fellowship with his disciples when he provides the breakfast by the sea. But the finale is when Jesus specifically refers to Peter in verse 22, at the end of, of the chapter, he says, you must follow me. From total hopelessness, confusion, to an awakening of faith, we're brought to a personal call to follow Christ. As a church and as Christians, we're not called to follow one another, no. Or our expectations and human interpretations of who God should be, for they can be blinding. Or some circumstances which can put Jesus in our blind spot. But the only solution is to go back to when we first met him.
As one preacher noted, we stick to our nets very often, but what are you holding for? Nothing and no one should have the right to dictate what our personal relationship with Christ will be or how we will serve him. May we never neglect our relationship with him lest we catch ourselves with our eyes veiled and ears shut even when he calls us by name. May we be reminded by the words in Isaiah chapter 43 verse one, do not fear for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. Amen.